Thank you for joining us uh, today uh, for this, what will be an important conversation with Professor John Mearsheimer. We meet uh, at the most dangerous geopolitical crisis moment in Europe since World War II. I can't think of anyone who could speak to that moment more effectively. Uh, John Mearsheimer is many things. Uh, we were talking on the Zoom in these last weeks, he's been receiving some 1,000 emails a day, which I think speaks to the um, interest in perhaps not agreeing with Professor Mearsheimer, but hearing a different point of view, an alternative point of view, a counter to what we hear on our screens and uh, in our, on our computers. So it's, uh, it's very important to have that debate. I wanna just say that the uh, group sponsoring this today is the American Committee for East-West Accord. Uh, it was launched in the 70s at a time of detente strength parity. Uh, my late husband, Stephen Cohen, relaunched the committee in 2014, a perilous moment in Ukrainian, Russian, US relations, NATO. And I think that with a small team, a very important board, uh, we've worked against headwinds uh, to fulfill a mandate of, build, of at least building dialogue, restraint, realism, different point of view. Again, that alternative point of view, which uh, is missing in our media and politics. And we believe our work, even against the headwinds and the brutality we witness is more important than, more important than ever. Um, I want to introduce briefly, someone who doesn't need an introduction, Professor Mearsheimer. Uh, he's uh, noted for his courageous book with Steve Walt on the uh, issues of American support for Israel. Uh, he is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago, where he's taught since 1982. Graduated from West Point, PhD in political science from Cornell University and has written extensively about security issues in international politics. A uh, distinguished scholar, his principal work on Ukraine, though I may be wrong, was a very important essay in September, October Foreign Affairs 2014, Why the Ukraine Crisis is the West's Fault. The video of that talk has been viewed more than 9 million times. Again, speaking to an interest in points of view that may not be popular, but are important to hear as we try to find our way out of this crisis. So I thank you, uh, John, and remember the traveling in Germany where you and Steve took on Joschka Fischer and Timothy Garden Ash <laughs> <laughs> against a room of hostile bankers, and you survived that. So I'm grateful to you in this difficult time, uh, this crisis time, this geopolitical crisis time for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to be here. And I recall our travels in Germany fondly, uh, especially when Steve and I uh, debated the uh, Ukraine issue uh, back then. Uh, I agree with what you said, by the way, uh, Katrina, when you said that this is the most dangerous crisis since uh, the Second World War. I think it's actually more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is not to minimize the danger of that crisis. Uh, but I think uh, basically what we have here is a war between the United States and Russia, uh, and uh, there's no end in sight. Uh, I cannot think of how this can end uh, in the near future, uh, and I think there's a very dangerous uh, chance of escalation. Uh, first of all, escalation to where the United States is actually doing the fighting uh, against Russia. The two sides are clashing militarily, which hasn't happened so far. And I think there's a serious danger of nuclear escalation here. I'm not saying that it's likely, but uh, I can tell stories on how it actually happens. So the question is, how did we get into this mess? You know, so what caused it? And the reason it's very important to deal with that issue is it has all sorts of implications for understanding Russian thinking. Uh, if you want to understand how the Russians think about this crisis, you have to understand the causes. 
Uh, now, the mainstream view, which I, of course, reject, is that Vladimir Putin is either a congenital aggressor or uh, he is just determined to recreate the Soviet Union or some version of, of the Soviet Union. He's an expansionist. He's an imperialist. Uh, I think that argument is wrong. And my view is that this is really all about the West's efforts to turn Ukraine into a Western bulwark on Russia's borders. Uh, and the key element in that strategy, of course, is NATO expansion. And in my story, it all goes back to the April 2008 decision at the NATO summit in Bucharest, uh, where it was said that both Georgia and Ukraine would become part of NATO. The Russians made it manifestly clear at the time that this was unacceptable, that neither Georgia nor Ukraine were going to become part of NATO. And in fact, the Russians made it clear that they viewed this as an existential threat. Uh, very important to understand those words. From the Russian point of view, from the get-go, this was perceived as an existential threat. Lots of people in the West do not believe uh, it is an existential threat to the Russians. But what they believe is irrelevant, because the only thing that matters is what Putin and his fellow Russians think, and they think it is an existential threat. Uh, now, I think to be honest, that the evidence is overwhelming, that this is not a case of Putin acting as an imperialist, uh, and it is a case of NATO expansion. Uh, if you look at his February 24th speech justifying why uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, it is all about uh, NATO expansion, uh, and the fact that that is perceived to be, by him, uh, an existential threat to Russia. If you look at the deployment of forces in Ukraine, it's hard to make the argument that the Russians are bent on conquering and occupying and integrating Ukraine into a greater Russia. Uh, if you listen to Zelensky talk about a possible solution, the first thing he goes to is talking about creating a neutral Ukraine. That tells you that this is really all about NATO expansion and Ukrainian neutrality. Furthermore, there is no evidence of uh, Putin saying that what he wants to do uh, is actually make Ukraine part of Russia. Uh, there's no evidence of him saying that this is feasible uh, and that he intends to do it. Uh, there's no question that in his heart, he would like to see uh, Ukraine be part of Russia. Uh, in his heart, he would probably like to see the Soviet Union come back. But as he has made manifestly clear, that is not possible. And anybody who thinks that way is not thinking straight. He has, in effect, said that. Uh, so I would like someone to point out to me the evidence where he makes it clear that what he is actually doing in terms of formulating policy is trying to create a greater Russia or reconstitute the Soviet Union. Uh, all of this is to say, if you believe, like I do, that he is facing an existential threat, you're in effect saying he views this as a threat to Russia's survival. And if he's in a situation like that, he cannot lose. When you face an existential threat, you don't lose. You have no choice. You have to win. Now, this brings us to the American side. What are the Americans doing? What we're doing, which is what we did uh, after the crisis broke out on February 22nd, 2014, is we're doubling down. Uh, we have decided that what we're going to do is we are going to defeat Russia inside of Ukraine. We're going to deliver a decisive defeat against the Russians inside of Ukraine. And at the same time, we're going to strangle their economy. We're going to put wicked sanctions on them, and we're going to bring them to their knees. We, in other words, are going to win, and they're going to lose. Furthermore, 
the Biden administration and the president himself has gone to enormous lengths to ramp up the rhetoric and portray the Russians as the font of all evil and to portray us as the good guys and to create the impression in people's minds that this is a situation that doesn't lend itself to compromise because you can't compromise with the devil. In fact, what has to be done here is we have to win. Now, you know that it would be a devastating defeat for Joe Biden if the Russians were to win this war. And of course, as I just said to you, from the Russian point of view, they have to win this war because this is an existential threat that they are facing. So the question you then want to ask yourself is, where does that leave us? Both sides have to win. It's impossible for both sides to win. Not when you think about the situation that we're facing here. So how do we get a negotiated settlement? I, I just don't see it happening. I don't see the Russians giving any meaningful ground, and I certainly don't see the Americans giving any meaningful ground. So what is likely to happen? There's now talk on our side, and even on the Russian side, that this war is going to go on for years. In other words, we're going to have a war between the United States and Russia that goes on for years. Now, I understand that we are not involved in the fighting at this point, but we are about as close as you can get to being involved. And then you start saying to yourself, is it not possible that we will get dragged into this one? Uh, there's a huge amount of political pressure on the Biden administration for us, you know, to implement the no-fly zone, to actually go in for humanitarian purposes to Ukraine, and so forth and so on. So far, Bi so far Biden has been able to resist that pressure, but will he be able to resist it forever? And what if we have a military incident that drags us into the fighting? So we could very well end up in a situation where the United States and Russia are fighting against each other in Ukraine. Then we come to the issue of nuclear escalation. Uh, I think, first of all, if the United States gets dragged into a fight against Russia, uh, and it's a conventional war in Ukraine or over Ukraine in the air, uh, the United States will clobber the Russians. Uh, if the Ukrainians are doing so well against the Russians militarily, you can imagine how much better the Americans will do in air-to-air -air engagements and even on the ground, right? In that situation, don't you think it's possible that Ukraine, I mean, excuse me, that Russia would turn to nuclear weapons? I think it's possible. Uh, I've studied a lot of military history. I've studied the Japanese decision to attack the United States at Pearl Harbor in 1941. I've studied the German decision um, to launch World War I during the July crisis in 1914. Uh, I've looked at the Egyptian decision to attack Israel in 1973. These are all cases where decision makers felt they were in a desperate situation, and they all understood that in a very important way they were rolling the dice, they were pursuing an incredibly risky strategy, but they just felt they had no choice. They felt that their survival was at stake. Uh, so what we're talking about here is taking a country like Russia, right, that thinks it's facing an existential threat, that thinks its survival is at stake, and we're pushing it to the limit. We're talking about breaking it. We're talking about not only defeating it in Ukraine, but breaking it economically. I think this is a remarkably dangerous situation, and I find it quite remarkable that we're approaching this whole issue in such a cavalier way. And by the way, I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that so many people who were involved in thinking about this problem today were raised during the unipolar moment and not during the Cold War. During the Cold War, as someone like Jack can tell you even better than me, we thought long and hard about nuclear war. We thought long and hard about U.S.-Soviet relations and how that might lead to a nuclear war. People who grew up in the unipolar moment are much more cavalier about these issues. And I think this presents a very dangerous situation. Now, I would note that even if the Russians 
and the Americans don't end up fighting each other, but the Ukrainians are able to stagger the Russians in Ukraine and deliver significant defeats on them, the Russians may still turn to nuclear weapons. It's possible. Is it likely? No, but it's possible. And that scares me greatly. And it should scare most Americans and certainly most Europeans. So all of this is to say, when I look at the U.S.-Russia relationship today, I think we're effectively at war with each other, although, again, the Americans are not fighting against the Russians on the battlefield. But this is a very dangerous situation. Now, what about Ukraine? Don't the Ukrainians have any agency? I mean, after all, it's their country that's being destroyed. One could make the argument that the West, especially the United States, is willing to fight this war to the last Ukrainian. Uh, and the end result is Ukraine is, in effect, being wrecked as a country. Given that they have agency, is it not possible that the Ukrainians themselves will say enough is enough and put an end to this? Uh, sadly, I don't think that's the case. And I think the fact is that the United States will not allow the Ukrainians to cut a deal that the United States finds unacceptable. The Washington Post had a piece on Monday that made it very clear that the administration and our NATO allies are very worried that the Ukrainians are going to cut a deal with the Russians that makes it look like the Russians won war that in fact concedes that the Russians have won, at least to some extent. We do not want that to happen. As I said before, the Biden administration is out to inflict a decisive defeat on Russia. If the Ukrainians decide to cut a deal and allow Russia to win in some meaningful sense, the Americans are gonna say that's unacceptable. And the Americans will work with the right-wing nationalists in Ukraine to undermine Zelensky or his successor. So I see no way Ukraine can stop, step in and put a stop uh, to this crisis. I just see it going on and on. Um, let me conclude by saying that George Kennan said uh, in the late 1990s uh, that NATO expansion was a tragic mistake. Uh, and that it would lead to the beginning of a new Cold War. Uh, at first, it looked like he was wrong. We had the first tranche of expansion in 1999, uh, and we got away with it. We had the second tranche of expansion in 2004, and we got away with that. But then when the decision was made in April 2008 for a third tranche, which would include Georgia and Ukraine, it's quite clear that we had moved a bridge too far. And the end result, I'm sad to say, is that I think that Kennan's uh, prediction has proved true. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, Professor Mearsheimer, for that um, rather alarming uh, wake-up call. Um, I hope some people in, uh, in positions of power here in Washington uh, are listening. Um, I'm going to introduce our esteemed accurate panel and after the panelists make their remarks we'll circle back and begin the Q&A and hopefully begin the discussion among the panelists um, and with those of you in the audience who have been kind enough to join us today. Marlene Laruel is director of the Institute for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies at the uh, George Washington University, where she is a research professor of international affairs. Uh, she, like our other panelists, is a prolific writer and lecturer, uh, and she has two books out over the past year, uh, Memory, Politics, and the Russian Civil War, and Is Russia Fascist? Uh, Unraveling Propaganda East uh, and West. Uh, Nikolai and Petro is professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island. Uh, his scholarly awards include two Fulbrights, uh, one to Russia and one to Ukraine, uh, and numerous other awards. Uh, last year, he was a visiting fellow at the Institute of Advanced Studies at the University of Bologna in Italy. Uh, today at 4.30, uh, streaming live on YouTube, he will be part of a discussion uh, that is discussing the Ukraine crisis um, 
as part of the Watson Institute at, at Brown, and we've posted the details in the in the chat. So we would urge people to go and check that out. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Ambassador Jack Madlock. Uh, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the Soviet Union from 1987 to 1991. Uh, he was Senior Director for European and Soviet Affairs on President Reagan's NSC staff, and he was Ambassador to Czechoslovakia from 1981 to 1980. Three, he is the author of numerous articles and books, including the superb and ever relevant Superpower Illusions, How Myths and False Ideologies Led America Astray, and How to Return to Reality. Uh, so Mr. Ambassador, uh, thanks for joining us and the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much. I think we have heard from Professor Mearsheimer uh, a brilliant analysis of what the situation that we're in, and I agree totally with everything he has described. And I must say that uh, in looking at things today, I am, I cannot be optimistic. Um, and first of all, I think that so uh, it has made clear that whatever happens in the future, uh, Ukraine cannot be preserved as a you might say, a viable and successful state within those borders that it inherited in 1991. And I say inherited because these borders were set actually literally by communists uh, and uh, uh, they, um, uh, they include areas that had not been traditionally part of Ukraine. And the tragedy of Ukraine, one of them has been that as they were struggling as all the other ex-Soviet states to throw off the shackles of communism and all the irrationalities of that, uh, they were confronted uh, with a population that was deeply divided. And they were also um, uh, subjected to a constitution uh, which did not allow federalism, a federal system, uh, which would somehow uh, give more local autonomy uh, to uh, different groups. So that you had a seesaw uh, uh, elections uh, where by slightly more than 50%, the presidency would be won by one side or the other. And then that president would name all the equivalent of the state governors, the provincial leaders. That was a recipe for disaster. Uh, and because there was no leader coming forward, uh, that really defined a, a, you might say, a new sense of Ukrainian statehood, uh, which would um, be comfortable both to the Ukrainian speakers and the Russian speakers. So Ukraine's problem uh, was internal. Now, as we have gone forward in our policies, I think that as Professor Mearsheimer made clear, what we have to consider is not our analysis of the way things are, but what the Russian perception is. Uh, after all, people act on their perceptions and the Russian perception is that we have aggressively um, uh, attempted uh, to detach um, both Ukraine and Georgia uh, from uh, any substantial influence by Russia. By the way, if another country had done something similar to one of our neighbors, uh, we would have reacted, I believe, uh, perhaps even more forcefully uh, than uh, uh, President Putin has. So I think we have to bear that in mind. There's almost a hysteria today in condemning Russia. Uh, as a, uh, and as a uh, unprovoked aggressor, yes, Russia has been an unprovoked aggressor, but they had a precedent. What do you think the US uh, attack on Iraq was? A country nearly halfway across the world, which did not threaten us and had not threatened us, we had attacked it, invaded it, cheered 
for our technology that enabled them. No images of how this affected the people on the ground. You know, I'm ashamed to say that the United States has given President Putin every trick in his playbook. Now, that doesn't make it right what he has done, but we need to. Now, this attempt, in effect, to wage a virtually total war against Russia, um, I think is deeply and deeply misguided. We face so many threats, mutual threats. We're not over the COVID uh, uh, epidemic yet. Uh, the, this fighting and all of the refugees and so on, this almost certainly is going to make it worse. Uh, and we have the whole nuclear threat, which uh, Professor Mearsheimer has described very well. Uh, but, and what about the, the long-term threats of global warming? Uh, how are we going to continue to deal with all these flows of refugees, whether they be economic or, or whatnot? We are simply undermining the, the real long-term interests of our countries in getting into this sort of fight. And I would also say those who think we're simply going to choke Russia and bring it down should understand that this is going to have a serious effect on many other people. Uh, in my day when I was in the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union had to import close to 30 million tons of grain a year just to survive. This was a tremendous uh, liability, and it's one that we were able to use to pressure them in many ways. Right now, both Ukraine and Russia are net and major grain exporters. It tells you what the new system is like and how different it is from the Soviet Union, by the way. And this affects many countries. You start cutting off that trade. Uh, and also uh, the, the trade not only in uh, uh, energy, uh, but also in precious metals and other things which are essential uh, for much of modern technology. You know, I think that uh, we're going to see if we continue these policies, and it looks as if we're going to, a real a pushback uh, by people who are not willing really uh, to, to take some of the cost to them uh, for uh, these sanctions because they are there. And finally, I would say don't underestimate the Russian ability uh, to uh, over in a fairly short period of time to overcome some of the technological problems. I also think that the use of the, uh, of the dollar as a weapon, which is what we have been doing, is going in the long run to undermine uh, our dominance of the world financial system. That may take a decade or two but I think there are very serious implications entirely aside uh, from uh, the nuclear threat, which is very much there. Though I agree with Professor Mearsheimer, it is not probable, but it is possible. And we have to worry about that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, Marlene, you're up. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for inviting me. Um, several points I wanted to make. The first one is that I agree about the shared responsibility of the West in the kind of strategy deadlock and the fact that Russia is seeing NATO expansion as an existential threat. But I would still dissociate the strategic de deadlock, <clears throat> which is a shared responsibility from the decision to do war. And to do that kind of war, a full-scale invasion targeting civilian. And for me, <clears throat> sorry, this is Russia's alone decision. In fact, it's Putin's alone decision taken against, <clears throat> sorry, the will of the majority of the Russian political establishment. So I think there was other ways for Russia to react than the war. And the war is weakening, 
sorry, Russia CG Team AC on, on the long run. <clears throat> I have three key points I just wanted to make. The first one is the question of avoidability. The war was avoidable. It was not written in the Putin's regime DNA that they would invade. There was many other ways they wanted to be influential and to keep spheres of influence. And of course, Russia is a former colonial imperial center. It has disdain toward the new uh, post-Soviet societies, but that could have stayed only at the kind of cultural, societal aspect, and that should may not have been transformed into, into a war. And when I say that there are, there are many ways of being a great power, and I think Russia has genuinely tested several uh, uh, of them, and really in the 2000s thought that integrating into the world community, into the world economy would make its voice heard and its claims kind of partly uh, uh, recognized. And it's only when they realized that this integration strategy was not working, that the kind of classic old fashioned sphere of influence mechanism was not working, that they begin looking to other strategies that were more related to kind of maintaining, keeping or provoking territor territorial instability in the, 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 the countries around. So what I'm trying to say that there have been for me a shift from Russia thinking it can keep Ukraine in a sphere of influence away from NATO to moving to a, a, a strategy that is now about territorial conquest or at least grab of land. And I agree, Russia and Putin doesn't want to recreate the Soviet Union or the Russian empire. It's not about that. It's using now grab of lands as a kind of solution to the failure of being respected as a great power. And I think that's a, that's a, 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 a very concerning uh, a trend. My second point is that uh, Professor Scheimer, you were saying about it's all about NATO expansion for Russia. And I think it was the case until now. Sure, it is now anymore. I think now, unfortunately, it has become much more complex on the Russian side. And I think we have to recognize there have been a kind of crescendo, a gradual move in the way Russia is framing the conflict that is of concern. What we have now, it's narrative that are ambiguously either about the strategic concern of uh, a Ukraine or joining NATO, or that as about purely denying Ukraine's legitimacy as a state and as a nation. There have been really ambiguous comments in uh, uh, Putin uh, uh, speeches and of uh, uh, several of other official governments. I mean, there are real strategies of destatization of Ukraine that I found problematic. I found there are Russian kind of schizophrenic narrative about Ukrainians need to be told by force that they are a brotherly nation with Russia and all the narrative about denazification. I mean, Ru Ukraine has a far right culture. Russia has one, the US has one. You have transnational far right groups. I don't think the way it has been framed by Russia is legitimate. It's really, and you may have seen the RIA Novosti articles a few days ago. It's really calling for mass killing. And of course, it's free and novelty. It's not an official statement by Putin or Lavrov, but it has been authorized. So my, what I'm trying to say now is that it has become more complex on the Russian side. I think because of the failure of getting their great power claim respected, now they have moved to something that is much more complex and much more dangerous. And my third point is that the Russian's vision is not static. And I think we have, it's not written in stone as we have seen it's evolving. And I think we have to realize now that things are still evolving on the Russian side because war is a kind of revolutionary open-ended moment. And so Russia is still adjusting its own vision, its own narrative and its own capacities on the ground and all that is in flux. And I think it's important for us to realize that you have all these contradictory narratives arriving from the Russian side. Sometimes Russia seems to say it's just about getting a friendly regime in Kiev and being sure that Ukraine is neutral. Sometimes it seems to be saying like Ukraine should be partitioned and Eastern territories should join Russia or be a kind of buffer zone. And sometimes it's about Ukraine is not legitimate to exist at all. And I think we should realize this complexity because what is telling us, it's telling us that there are tensions at the Kremlin. The Kremlin is not a unified uh, uh, system. You have, it's an ad, ad, ad hoc construction and there is a party of war in Russia that is pushing for the radicalization of narrative. That is very unhappy with the diplomatic talks going on now. And I think it's really important for us to realize at least this three language of Russia on the war and the NATO one is unfortunately 
not the only one now. And we have to be sure we try to invite Russia to going back to discussing the neutrality issues, which is the, the easiest one, in fact, and avoiding the Russian uh, uh, policy moving toward really accusation of Ukraine not being a legitimate state, because that would make the discussion relatively impossible to, to, uh, uh, um, to finalize. And I agree with you about the fact that, I mean, we need to, fast, to find face saving solution for Russia. And we need to be sure that if Ukraine is able to cut a deal with Russia, there is no US kind of regime change strategies or maintaining of sanctions that would of course make things impossible uh, on the Russian side to be, to be accepted. So I'm just, I will stop here, but just to say that I think things are still very much in flux, that it's mostly a shared responsibilities, but the war is Putin's responsibility largely against the will of his own governments. And that we have now worrisome narratives coming from the Russian side about Ukraine legitimacy to exist that we should take into consideration and do our best to try to push Russia to go back about just discussing the, the strategic aspect and, and, and stopping NATO expansion and not moving to really narrative that are, that are uh, uh, disempowering the pure existence of, of Ukraine. I will stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Nick, it's all yours. Thank you. I have a few words to say about tragedy and international relations theory. Tragedy in international relations has certain general characteristics, but each generation must also deal with its own particular tragic demons. I would highlight three of those the loss of the ability to communicate, the loss of a common legal framework, and the loss of shared values. The loss of the ability to communicate precludes dialogue. Indeed, many politicians and diplomats no longer understand what dialogue means. They think it means indicating that to one party what the other party wants. But that is essentially what a prison warden does to his inmates. In fact, the logos in dialogos means to gather together. And it is sometimes rendered as relationship. The famous opening line of the gospel according to St. John could thus be read. In the beginning was the relationship. The proper objective of dialogue is not a momentary accord, but a profound self-transformation that establishes a new relationship with the enemy. Classical Greek tragedy is thus quintessentially a series of dialogues in which we expose our own tragic flaws to ourselves. This exposure is meant to bring about catharsis, a purging of the soul that restores healthy perspective by removing hatred. Our reluctant willingness to sign technical agreements with other countries, while emphasizing at the same time our values disagreements with them, is thus the exact opposite of dialogue. Our second tragedy is the loss of a common legal framework. I refer here to the much discussed distinction between an international legal order and a rules-based order. The West has in recent years worked hard to replace the former with the latter, while breezily suggesting that they are the same thing. Much of the rest of the world, however, has said they are not and has suggested that what the West is really trying to do here is to privatize the international legal order and to make it serve whatever rules the West finds most beneficial. Our third tragedy has a rather long and distinguished pedigree. I'm referring here to the fruits of the poison tree of American exceptionalism which causes many Americans to emphasize the values that divide us from the rest of the world, 
rather than the many interests that we share. This is what has transformed us from a mere nation state into an all judging nation church. That, as Andrew Basevich has pointed out, unites primarily to worship at the altar of American greatness. Since 2003, American officials have consistently chastised Russia for her, quote, breach of values, end quote. But make no mistake, other states are never far behind. These three tragedies are mutually reinforcing, and they lead to a foreign policy that can be summarized in a single phrase. There can be no dialogue with the axis of evil except about its terms of surrender to our rules. If one were to search for historical analogies, I suspect that the world order that we are headed toward will look a lot like the early 17th century, with its efforts to impose the one true faith during the Thirty Years' War. We have been told that Putin is trying to return us to the power politics of the 19th century. My greatest fear is that, is that we may one day look back on that with regret as an offer we should have taken. Thank you. Katrina, you need to- uh... Thank you for your, all of you for your most sobering, cogent range of analyses of the situation we confront. I wanna turn it over to some of the Q&A we have, but before that, if there's any discussion, any question, John, you may want, wish to reply, uh, or there may be questions from the panelists or additional comments in light of your other panelists' comments. Well, I'd love to reply, but I think it's better if we go to Q&A uh, rather than have me talk again. Okay, we are gonna do that. Um, and there are many, so, This is a question, I mean, I think for Marlene and um, to what extent, Professor Mearsheimer, uh, do you believe the Ukrainian far right stops the government in Kiev from cutting a deal with the Russians? <clears throat> I think that when Zelensky ran for president, he made it very clear that he wanted to work out an arrangement with Russia that ended the crisis in Ukraine. And he won. And what he then tried to do was move toward implementing the Minsk II agreement. If you were gonna shut down the conflict in Ukraine, you had to implement Minsk II. And Minsk II meant giving the Russian speaking and the ethnic Russian population in the easternmost part of Ukraine, the Donbass region, a significant amount of autonomy. And you had to make you, uh, the Russian language an official language of Ukraine once again. That had to be done. I think Zelensky found out very quickly that because of the Ukrainian right, it was impossible to implement Minsk II. Therefore, even though the French and the Germans, and of course the Russians were very interested in making Minsk II work because they wanted to shut down the crisis, they couldn't do it. In other words, the Ukrainian right was able to stymie Zelensky on that front. Now, Zelensky understands that if he cuts a deal with Russia today, he has to face the Ukrainian right. That's why Zelensky has said that any peace agreement has to be approved by the Ukrainian public. He's gonna ask for a referendum because Zelensky understands that he cannot take the Ukrainian right on by himself. So basically, we have a situation where Zelensky is stymied. 
Now, very importantly, the Americans will side with the Ukrainian right because the Americans and the Ukrainian right both do not want Zelensky cutting a deal with the Russians that makes it look like the Russians won. So this is the principal reason uh, I'm very uh, pessimistic about Ukraine's ability to help shut this one down. Nikolai, this is a question about, it's really about language, but it's something deeper than that. Do you believe the Ukrainian language and identity in the West around Lviv uh, is going to become the predominant cultural engine of the Ukrainian idea, identity? And what effects will this war leave on majority Russian-speaking cities? That is something we can only speculate about. On the one hand, it uh, looking at historical examples of brutal invasions in the past, the American seizure of uh, half of Mexican territory in the Mexican-American War uh, and how relations have evolved since then, the <clears throat> uh, English um, conquest of Ireland, uh, which is still uh, traumatic and, and has a, a left a, a gash in, in the territories of Northern Ireland, um, we can say that uh, there uh, it engenders a period of great hostility, but that over time, you know, uh, there, there's a monument on the battlefield of Poltava that I visited in Ukraine, and it's in three languages, and it says, time heals all wounds. And I think in the long run, there's nothing, uh, there's no way to escape the destiny uh, that Ukraine and Russia must share together because those countries are not going anywhere. And uh, no matter what the current generation thinks and the next generation thinks, that is absolutely no predictor of uh, several generations down the road. Could I add something, Katrina? Yeah, I mean, what we are seeing now is that the Russian speaking Ukrainians are siding with Ukraine, largely the Russian speaking cities are largely on the Ukrainian side. I mean, you always have people who are on the Russian side. We, there are some small flows of uh, refugees going on the Russian side because that's where they feel more comfortable. The Donbass population, those who were already uh, uh, secessionists are more on the Russian side. But I think we should realize that the war is reshaping, re reshuffling the, the Ukrainian identity. And what you seems to have emerging now is a largely more unified Ukrainian identity in which Russian speaking Ukrainians feel good at home with Ukraine. So I think that is something that all the knowledge we had about all these kind of regional division of Ukraine culturally, linguistically, they will be totally transformed by the war. So I'm not sure we will have, and Delensky himself is not representing a kind of Galicia, Western type, uh, Western Ukraine type of identity, he's represented a much more kind of unified Russian speaking Ukrainian speaking at the same time identity. So I think many things are so much in flux that there will be a new Ukrainian nation and, and many of these questions will, will kind of be totally transformed. Thank you. Um, this is for Ambassador Matlock. Um, Ambassador, what insights do you have into the current state of US diplomacy and its deficiencies? It often seems that the idea of compromise is anathema to American officials and Americans in, in general because issues are portrayed in terms of pure good and evil that only allows for total victory. And I was very interested in what Professor Mearsheimer alluded to, which is that the Biden administration officials, so many of them are of a different, they grew up in the unipolar moment. So they don't have the experience of uh, the Cold War and the dual. <coughs> well, I think one of the problems is that our diplomacy since the late 1990s has been virtually the opposite of that which we used to in the Cold War. Um, we had several, I would say, uh, operational principles when we began to negotiate an end to the Cold War. We seem to be almost at its height around 1983-1984. But we decided that we would start 
first of all, trying to look for areas of common interest and concentrate more attention on them. Second, to listen very carefully to what the Soviets were saying, to stay always in communication. And though President Reagan, for example, condemned the Soviet Union as an evil empire, he never insulted any Soviet leader. He treated them with respect. And when he met them personally, uh, his first words were usually, we hold the peace in our hands, we must act responsibly. And, you know, uh, then also issues like human rights and so on, which were largely comments on their internal affairs, we began to shift more to a private conversation rather than public condemnations and public demands, which we understood would be, you know, tend to be rejected. And within about a three year period, we had uh, found uh, that since it was in the interest of both countries to end the arms race, to end uh, the confrontation, we negotiated an end and it was not a defeat for the Soviet Union. Uh, now, since then, we have the idea that somehow we won the Cold War in, a, in the sense that Russia was defeated. No, the Soviet Union, we ended it with the Soviet Union two years before the Soviet Union broke up. It broke up not because of our pressure from the outside, but because of problems inside. But, you know, beginning in the late 90s and the first such move uh, was the decision to start expanding NATO. And at first it was acceptable, but it should have been clear from the very beginning. If we were going to expand NATO, we had to stop at a certain point. There was going to be a red line. And I joined, uh, 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 you know, I joined George Cannon and others in testifying to the Senate that a decision to expand NATO would be one of the worst strategic decisions we could have made since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but even so, we could have gotten by with it if we had, if it had just included a few East European countries. So it seems to me that then we started a, a policy of in effect treating Russia as if it were a defeated nation. At the same time, uh, we interfered directly in their own elections. So we were very much involved in the 1996 election that, uh, that re-elected uh, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, then we, in, and also, then we began to walk out of almost every arms control treaty, which had been the basis of our ending the Cold War. Uh, and then uh, when uh, Putin began to complain about some of the things we were doing, like uh, putting uh, anti-ballistic missiles in Eastern Europe, uh, we, uh, we simply ignored that. We never addressed his complaints, most of which I would consider quite valid from a Russian point of view. It was not that necessarily all of them were totally accurate, but they, were, they represented perceptions which we should have dealt with. Instead, we increasingly, not only the media, uh, the principal media, but the government began to personalize everything. And I think that uh, we played a role in creating the Vladimir Putin that we see today, including giving him precedence for what he is doing. And why we can't recognize that is beyond me. Thank you, Ambassador Matlock. I, um, there are a set of questions here. I'm just going to this, this one might be for Marlene. Is Putin getting true and accurate information from his inner circle concerning the results in the war on the battlefield? Um, this is about Putin's inner circle. I, I might ask you, Marlene, you know, there, there is an assessment that Putin is unhinged, talking about Ambassador Matlock's personalization of the situation. But I think people would be interested in a brief sense of the circles inside Moscow, the war party, but also the roots 
that inform Putin's thinking at this stage to, uh, based on the speech he gave uh, a few weeks ago? Yeah, it seems so all the information we have is telling us that Putin was largely misinformed. He's still reading kind of old fashioned reports given to, by, to him by security services. And it seems they were painting an image that the war would be easy to win in Ukraine, that Ukrainians will be receiving Russia as liberator, that Kiev would feel very rapidly, that Zelensky would flee, that the Ukrainian army wouldn't resist, that the Russian army would make it very easily. So I think that was a, there was a real kind of a, a strategic mistake done by on the Russian side is in, uh, in um, getting the accurate information, probably because it's difficult to approach uh, Putin. We know he has been very isolated during the pandemics and people wanted all these uh, 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 people around him wanted to give him the, the most positive vision and that probably conducted to that uh, decision. And now we can see, so we know that some services of the FSB have been kind of fired or clean up after the, 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 the mistakes of their judgment was revealed. And now we have a much more realistic, if I may say, strategy of Russia in Ukraine, uh, uh, taking into consideration the, what is happening on the ground in trying just uh, with quotation mark to take control of the as of sea and the, the large uh, Donbass. In terms of what is really happening in Putin in inner circles, it's very difficult. We know there is a circle of advisor, a circle of friends who are able to access him and who seems to be feeding him with, with information and interpretation. And, but this inner circle is totally outside the government or even the presidential administration purview. And I think that's important to realize that because when we do diplomatic talk or when the diplomatic talks are going on, we are the Ukrainians are talking to official figure of the government, but no one is accessing this kind of private circle around Putin that seems to be really uh, uh, very influential. So there is this kind of parallel two states, the official one and the informal one, and we cannot access the informal one in trying to cut a deal. And I think that's part of the problem on, on, on the way we, we try to interpret what is happening on the on the Russian side. And then, as I was saying, there is a party of war that we can have some element of ID identification. We see some kind of tip of the iceberg. And I was mentioning these three Novosti articles a few days ago, really calling for mass killing in, in, um, in Ukraine that I think is telling us that there are some patterns inside the system that push for this kind of radical solution. And we also know that many members of the government are against the war. I mean, now they have to be consolidating around the, the leader, but we're surprised and shocked by the decision. So I think we have to realize that there is no unity at the Kremlin. It's a, it's a complex entity, a complex black box with many different uh, level and groups. And we want to try to speak to, to, to the more kind of rational one, the one yeah. that consider that strategic issues should be the key. Yeah, of course. And our obviously our behavior influences in war parties around the world. Nicola, not helping, of course, we have a war party here also. <laughs> Nick, you wanted to say something. And then I was thinking I would go to Professor Mearsheimer to say a few words in response to some of the questions and comments from participants. Nick, sir. Yes. Uh, in partial response to the question that was asked about um, the possibility of uh, Eastern Ukraine, what I call Russophile Ukraine, um, being transformed into uh, a more U U uh, Ukrainian, uh, pro-Ukrainian um, community. <clears throat> um, yes, as I said, that was that was that's something that uh, is inevitable in the short run. But as Marlene was um, commenting. I was, I remembered a quote that I read from Ukrainska Pravda. So this is March 24th of this year by Mikhail Dubinyansky, who is a very well-known commentator. And I just want to read it to you because it hits at the heart of the issue which hasn't gone away. Quote, in Ukraine, there is also an alternative view to what is happening. The view that this big war in Ukraine really hasn't changed much. 
forcing this war into the framework of our customary habits and prejudices. From this perspective, February 24th, 2022 looks not so much like a magical gateway into a new world, but more like a broken doorway through which to drag all the baggage of the recent past, all the old fixations, insults, and recriminations that defined Ukraine's public agenda before this full-scale invasion. It took but a moment for the front lines to stabilize before this traditional internal hate reemerged." end quote. Thank you. Powerful. Thank you. Um, thank you for a brilliant analysis of this perilous moment. I wanted to go back to Professor Mearsheimer to comment or to just speak in closing about um, the moment and what lies ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Katrina. I mainly wanted to respond to three sets of points that Marletta sure. made. Uh, first of all, you talked about Putin targeting civilians or the Russians targeting civilians. Uh, it's obviously very hard to tell exactly what's happened here, but with that caveat in mind, you want to remember that the Americans have been pushing to arm civilians in Ukraine and to tell those civilians to fight against the Russians. So by definition, in lots of the firefights that are, have taken place and will take place, Russians are going to be fighting against civilians because those civilians are fighting against the Russians. So just remember, this is a very complicated business. Second point has to do with Putin's thinking and also your comments about the narratives that are taking place inside Russia. The fact is, we have no idea who Putin is talking to. Uh, and we really have no idea exactly what he's thinking these days. There's just no way we could know that. And uh, it is, you use the term black box. It's kind of a black box. We can look at what he said on February 24th or February 21st and so forth and so on. But who knows for sure what he's thinking. Uh, when it comes to narratives, I've spent a lot of time thinking about how public discourse matches up with decision making in a crisis. If you go to a decision like the Cuban Missile Crisis or the German decision to invade France in 1940, basically you have a handful of policymakers in the room who are making the decision to do something. And what they think is what matters. And the narratives that are swirling around in the broader public really don't matter. Uh, so I understand that if you look at the narratives in Russia today, you can find all sorts of evidence of people talking about doing X or doing Y or doing Z in Ukraine. But in the end, what really matters is what Putin and his close advisors are thinking and why exactly they decided on February 24th to invade Ukraine. And we really don't have good information to analyze that situation at this point in time. My final set of comments, <coughs> excuse me, have to do with your point about Russian interest in grabbing territory in Ukraine. I actually think the Russians had zero interest in grabbing territory in Ukraine, and that includes Eastern Ukraine. The main reason that the Russians wanted to implement the Minsk II Accords and wanted to work with Zelensky to do that is they wanted to shut down the problem in Eastern Ukraine. They did not want to conquer the Donbass. Furthermore, when things really began to get bad in mid-February, they recognized those territories in the Donbass as independent states. They didn't move to make them part of Russia as they had done with Ukraine. And with regard to the future, 
it's not at all clear that Russia will move to take those parts of eastern Ukraine that it's conquered and integrate them into a greater Russia. I wouldn't be surprised if they created an independent state, simply because it's probably more trouble than it's worth to conquer that territory. So I don't think the Russians, contrary to the conventional wisdom in the United States, have really had any interest in conquering Ukraine. Because, as I said many years ago in the 2014 essay in Foreign Affairs that Katrina um, referenced in her introduction, for Russia, conquering Ukraine would be like swallowing a porcupine. Thank you. You're muted, Katrina. Um, I wanted to just say a few words. First of all, this is an example, it seems to me today, of uh, the importance of public debate, of informed debate, of debate informed by an understanding of history. Um, we, we meet in 2022, but as so many of you know very well, this is a situation which has long roots from our land way back, but I mean, at least 2014, as John's essay reminds. Uh, but I, I just want to say briefly about the, Amer the American Committee for East-West Accord. I mean, it is shocking, I know, to Ambassador Matlock that we are at a moment where the embassies and consulates are shut down. You spent much of your time as ambassador, I think, trying to ensure that Russians could travel and that there would be access. But from nuclear nonproliferation to economics to energy, uh, these have been heedlessly, dangerously discarded as projects of cooperation. Um, and we look back, uh, we look at the end of the Soviet Union, but we also look today at 2014 where decisions were made. NATO expansion was referenced, different points of NATO expansion. But I, I think I conclude with, I don't think there's ever been an absence of American discourse, democratic discourse is such a fateful with the ability to continue this discourse in the you know, the face of what Professor Mearsheimer rightly referenced, a frenzy, a frenzy of, you know, there is barbarity, uh, but there's also an understanding that uh, there's a need to end it. And if we're going to end it, there has to be some sense of history. So I just want to thank you all uh, for participating in this civil debate. And uh, there's more to be done, and I hope we'll, we will continue more of these. And I thank you, Professor Mearsheimer. It's, I'm sure it's a very, it's a very difficult, uh, you know, obviously for Ukrainians and for this geopolitical crisis, but to have a voice uh, that is speaking in the ways you are is important. Uh, there is a lockdown of, of uh, information and analysis and history. As you mentioned, the narratives Narratives are important. So um, my view is, you know, we can't have a stable world until there's partnership, if not, you know, partnership between the US and Russia. Uh, it's gonna be very hard to get to. Uh, we are working at the nation and at Acura with people inside Russia, the independent press, and trying to uh, ensure that, my last point is that the demonization of Russians doesn't swallow up and contrib contribute to an enduring Cold War. But thank you very much for all joining, taking time out of your busy days and um, grateful to you, Professor Mearsheimer. My pleasure.